I know I had them, but don't now. They just went away. But who knows how? Might have been, might have been all the cycling I've been doing has left me hemorrhoid free. Kind of flies in the face of common sense. All that I can tell you is it worked for me. All right, that's number 31 in this series. <laughs> Here, though, is uh, here's the, the one I've uh, written most recently, and uh, it's uh, number 35, as I mentioned. And this goes out to all those who might subscribe to the butterfly theory, uh, if you know what that is. Um, this, it, it comes up in this piece. In a calm interlude, eyeing the ferry boat crossing the sound, I see that it ruffles the waterway so that its wake extends all the way back to the far shore. This gets me to wondering if I do not stir up a similar ruckus, except in the air, while traveling along by the seat of my pants. I shall try to be wary of this happenstance the next time I go cycling, for if it is true, and that's what I do, I've been disturbing the peace, upsetting the apple cart, knocking the breeze for a row of ash cans, inciting typhoons with my hard charging knees for most of my life. And not only me, do you pedal a bike? Well, what do you know? You've been doing it too. It's a wonder we've never been called to account. I'll say no more about it if you won't. <laughs> and so it continues. I'd like to uh, close my portion here with a piece that I wrote many years ago. It takes us back to my boyhood and actually to my grandmother's kitchen in Coshocton, Ohio. And uh, the old tin cup, which was a favorite artifact. Uh, this is a, well, it got lost. Uh, when when my grandmother passed away and the house was broken up, I think I think her lawyer stole it. Actually, I've been trying to get my hands on it, but it was gone. So here is an old tin cup, part one, but not forgotten, and it'll be followed by part two, which is called Nocturne. An old tin cup. It sat there handy by the kitchen sink for as many years as you were aware of. Anytime someone in the house got thirsty, it was the vessel responsibly used. Unless you chose to drink your fill directly from the faucet and leaned in low the way you do when no one's with you, gulping sideways, gasping, maybe soak your head while you were at it. But not when grandma stood there, no. Then you used the cup. Part two, Nocturne. While crickets chirped from hiding spots and lightning bugs went looking for them, things outside would quieten down when nightfall ended summer hijinks. You've come in from kick the can and mother may I, panting, grass stained, itchy and perspiring, to stand in the darkened kitchen, listening, playmates' voices calling, See ya! Distant southbound passing freight. The Mahoney's dog has gone indoors. Just crickets now. You cool your face on the counter tiles. Run the water on your wrists until it's good and cold. Pick up the cup and fill it. Drink and fill it. Drink. You drink and fill it up. The cup itself, cold. Ah, drink it. All you can hold. And if grandma stood right there, she'd say, oh, that cold water tastes as good as anything there is. Conveyed to the lip in an old tin cup. It tasted just the way you wish that water still could always taste, which even then you might have known. It never would that good again. <laughs> uh, I feel summer ending, and uh, I thought I'd read that one because uh, it always brings that, uh, that to me at least, that sensation of, uh, well, 
going to have to come in a little earlier because tomorrow's a school day, that sort of feeling. Uh, so for those of you who are going back to school or starting school or teaching again, I know some of you are, uh, that was for you. And thank you very much. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. You you did definitely, you took me right back to my childhood in those days and uh, endless summer days. And when mm. it went down, it was, it was tinged with such nostalgia, excitement, sorrow, all kinds of things that uh, brought it all in. Thank you, man. That was great. Thank you. Okay, we're going to come uh, in the house uh, as Victoria. Victoria is here. Victoria Roscoe Romanis is going to come up to the podium and share some work with us. Good evening, Victoria. I think that's right. Is that is this good enough? I know. Okay. I think that's... How did we ever get by okay. without Kyle before? I don't know how, but thank but, you, Kyle. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. I think that might do. Can you everybody hear? I'm sure they can. Sure. I, just stay myself. close to that mic and we're good. <laughs> I can hear myself. I just got here in time, obviously. I'm sorry I was a little late tonight. But um, anyway, I guess it's my turn. <laughs> yep. The first one is called Aphrodite. Aphrodite. Um, as some of you might know, my son is in a monastery in Arizona. And this is one I was visiting uh, some years ago. Uh, I haven't been for quite a few years, not since before COVID. Um, so this is just a short piece of some one of the experiences I had. Aphrodite. Aphrodite, the goddess of love, spoke to me this morning, beautiful morning, filled with light. Love reflected from the old lady's eyes, radiant as the morning light. She held a disposable camera in her hand. Please take my picture with the Bougainvilleas for my son. In a mother's heart, her son brings warmth. I understand her love. My heart is full to overflowing, now visiting close to my son. Aphrodite was her name. She was taking love to her son. Soon, I will be leaving love behind with my son. Then, Always oh, hard to leave. <laughs> the next one is called the rattling teacups, and I don't know. Maybe it's a maybe it's a poem for Michelle, but I didn't write it just recently. I didn't know you, and I wrote this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> rattling teacups. The rattling of teacups. Early morning tea in the kitchen. A time to greet the day. A musical sound recalling tea with grandmother under the lilac tree. A comforting sound signals a time to pause. A meeting at Harbour Quay with friends on a warm summer's day or a cold, windy inlet day. Rattling teacups have power to bring calm. Whenever I see a table and chair on a sidewalk or on a patio. I don't know. There's just something about that. It just makes you want to have tea. <laughs> and I don't think that's got anything to do with being English because I think everybody loves a cup of tea or coffee, <laughs> but tea. <laughs> um, I decided to do something completely against regulations or, or, well, it's not regulation, whatever they you set for haikus. Um, I felt I was always using too many words and I wanted to go back and I used to do some coups years ago, haikus years, years ago. So I thought I'm not going to look up how they're supposed to be. I'm just going to, for now, I was sitting by the creek. It was beautiful, beautiful um, morning and I just thought, okay, I'm just going to do some three lines here. They're not, I know there's supposed to be a certain number of words on each line, but who cares? They're not, they're mine. <laughs> <laughs> So, the first one, <laughs> creek water running, softly washed rocks, canopy green. As you know, these are by the, mostly by the creek. 
cooling creek water, feet submerged, nature's soothing reflexology. Rain, much, much missed, earth's relief, more than a mirage. Scorching sun, relentless, borrowing heat below feet, lightning strikes, flames rise. Rocks in the creek, why are they here? Move them away, Nikita is here. Uh, I don't know if you know, I mentioned in my other poems about my dog, Nikita, she's got this passion. It's a, actually a mission. She has to go into the water, the creek or the lake and remove all the rocks. She's, it's a constant. She just in and out, she takes them way up on the bank, you know, that way away from the water and goes back in and gets another one. I'm really happy because I can't, I, with my back, I can't throw sticks and I can't throw stones for her because she just comes bounding back towards me and it's just would not be very sensible to do that. But she occupies herself, which is wonderful. So anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> thank Perfect. You. Thank you, Victoria. <laughs> thank you so much. That was great. And, and I think we started a theme tonight of, of cups and grandmas. And I noticed we'll that. See if that carries on. And, and Rochelle is probably going to feed right into that with some tea poetry. So yeah. right on the money. Grandma's in the picture tonight. <laughs> thank you. And I also want to point out, yeah, it's funny, isn't it, how, you know, poetry and poetic license is all about, you know, bending the rules and yet, yeah. yet right. you know, formed metrical poetry has so many rules, right, to, to conform <laughs> to. But then, of course, the poets love bending them and breaking them. So I'm all for you breaking the rules with the haiku. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it again. <laughs> All right, the moment we've all been waiting for, our featured reader, Rochelle Mecca, is joining us here in Port Alberni live at Shars Landing. Come on up, Rochelle. And I'll tell you a little bit about Rochelle on her way up here. She's got a couple of books of poetry out. Uh, she has been writing poetry since she was like 12 years old. She got bitten, something like that. <laughs> yeah. Bug or something, yes. oh. something yeah and and most poets it is there there's a, yeah. a moment where it's you just get oh, no. bit and that's it you're there's no <laughs> looking back so right. it was meant to be anyway rochelle uh her poetry is gonna uh inspire and invite thought and take us into a, a little bit of her perspective on the world and i can't <laughs> wait to hear it Take it away, Rochelle. Welcome to Electric Mermaid. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, I I was already struggling with getting enough or narrowing down the amount of poems I was going to read, so I'm just going to hop right into it. Okay. So first I'm going to read out of my first book called Chaos of Tao and just the little back thing that I wrote on the back. Do not seek your path directly and the path will shine brightly. See truth in everything which isn't to say that the world is full of lies, though it often can be. Truth is the essential force of nature itself, of yourself. This poetry is a collection of my vision of truth, exploring who I am beneath the surface. Words on the page are more expressive than what I can manage to say aloud. This work of art is a vision into my mind. Open the door, peer into my void, glimpse into the threshold between our worlds. Starting with mantra. Let it flow, let it be, let it come. I'll do what I can do, I can only move forward. It is always an expression of myself. Let the divine light shine through me. Resist my fear, the path is clear. Make them shatter with love. Let the light be balanced by darkness. Hold a cup of tea and surrender to the void. Know that laughter is my greatest strength. A journey into the Tesseract. Is this me? Am I really there? Inside the Tesseract, I see myself across the walls. Memory's not mine. I don't remember that happening, but I think I would do that. She sounds like me. She talks like me. I don't know her. How do I know what's real when everything I see is an illusion of who I am? Close my eyes. See eternity. Every move I make leads me closer. Stop being afraid of who I can be. Brace myself for what's next. Know my heart, 
reach for my darkest self and I will come out as pure light. See an asteroid belt rush past my eyes, feel myself blown out of its circuit like a gust of wind, thrown out across the starlit galaxy, stop and gain control. Feel every nerve as it pinches and aches, fingertips exploding, toes writhing, eyes straining. It's not safe here. Heart heaving, hips twisting, and suddenly, perfectly still, body gone. I am the void. If I see a memory that is not my own, it still becomes a memory. I can't unsee and unlearn it, so now it is a part of me. I can make the choice to go without thinking about it, but I don't get the choice to remove the effect that it has on me. I become a part of it, and it becomes a part of me. Key spirit. The leaf rings through my ears. My presence is welcomed by her spirit. The warmth in my cut I, cup I shall delightfully savor and sip. Through each round I will gain strength. For better and for love, my heart will be saved by this plant. Time for a sip of tea. Mm -hmm. mm. It doesn't happen too often, I just ate one. Dow man. A man isn't a man until he sits by the ocean side, hair in the air beneath the cooling sun, toes curling gently around the rocks above and below his feet. Fresh rippled light reflects off of glimmering waters, pointing to the mountains beyond. His hair knits itself a sweet and slow design of unbrushed golden locks. He flashes me a grin, a kiss on the cheek, leaps up from a squat, and runs naked into the water. <laughs> awareness reality warp time lapse blink my eyes everything shifts just a quick crackle in time space awareness no going back but alas what is different here than what i knew before for this may only be a shift in awareness of the present moment here i am but self is merely an illusion step forward see the light somewhere imprints focus focus i must try to see beams of light point at me Clo frantic frantic close my eyes materialize memories arise and here they take form find familiar faces an amoeba an antler hopefully a flower try to take control what am i looking for blend vision into static nay voices nay direction a lily bloomed and died Peek at the sun, red glow eyelids. Is that who I see? Hold fast and let go. A pebble in the water falls below. Light isn't always clear. Beams blind the eyes. Imprint dark images. You ever just close your eyes and try to see what is forming in there? Kind of, it's always kind of staticky, amoeba-like, and maybe you see something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Next one is called Hope is Power. Tell me about the greatest love that you have ever known. Does it take hold of you? How does it make itself known? Flooding the mind with memories, confusion of love and danger, it's light and, or despair, the two are paired. Resist, resist, I wouldn't dare. Not anymore. Hope is power. Nautical knots. O love long past, O love of future and present, the answers I crave and the answers from which I'll run away. What is the point of love that doesn't shine? How does it grab hold of its strings so loose? Nautical knots aren't meant to break. Nobody wants a sunken ship. All ships set sail and arrive back at a dock. Upon many docks they may land. A piece of your soul rests in every place you've ever been. Each memory you hold on to holds you to it as well. Forgetting is not the same as letting go. Letting go relieves, but does not forget. What is the truth of my memory? Is there any? Blushed cheeks with a glow in his eyes. Of course, he was drinking all night. He was mesmerized by the ability to fall in love. When he went out the door, seven minutes in heaven comes to an aching end. I learned what it felt like to miss someone. These memories are still so strong, the details so vivid for so long ago. I can't wipe them away, but maybe I can love them. 
Love is more powerful than pain. So why then does it hurt to imagine? When faced with the decision to love the past or to hide, I'd sooner hide. If indeed I love the past, that should mean I'll fall in love over and over again. How is that fair to my life now? How would it help me? In the darker depths of my mind, there's an unswept corner. It keeps collecting dust, and as always, I sweep it away. How often do we watch each and every dirt particle as it lands on the kitchen floor, every carpet in the house, every surface? One can't monitor that just as well as we can't monitor memories. Humans are inclined to control rather than accept and harmonize. He's just a memory. He's just a memory and a good one. I've had happier, more joyful memories surrounding him in my consciousness as of late. I smile and say, I've loved him. Circumstance was wrong, so it didn't work. Love for the soul can still thrive. What is consciousness but the collection of souls traveling together through time and space in many long lifetimes? Are we connected? Maybe we had just that chance once in this lifetime and recognized each other as eternal selves. Just once in this lifetime, a tiny glimpse to see what love can be. Go back to your life. Keep searching for the truth. Love is all power. Love is the healer and the wound. My heart was broken, yet I learned to love more. That I can forgive. That I can adore. Your own hero. A hero's journey is never easy. Don't let the pain of yesterday hinder how you feel today. You're never just a hero to those around you. That doesn't matter. What matters is how you step up and become a hero to yourself. That is where the real pride comes from. You have to step outside of your home, outside of your comfort zone, and experience all that is out there in order to grow, in order to find out what your discomfort is and come to terms with it. The most important thing is to never give up. Keep searching and become your own hero. Death by pen. The trauma was live inside of me. I transferred its existence onto page. My pages may be haunted, but they hold a living memory. By the cast of the pen, pain was bled, scratched, bruised, carried by the sharp tip of the blade. My dagger grew in strength. Lost pens became one. One sword, keep me alive. Defend me from the ghosts of the past. <laughs> Horn Moon. Oh, the winds of change sweep me away. In your feeble, strong hands, I give you my soul. Oh, my seeking of dharma, of mystery to the end. All that I am is gathered. A special direction and path carried and placed and carved and set and hammered and dollied and battled and recovered and laid out and dug in and filled in, soon to be set with plants and complete. My task, my baby, my rebirth. Who is she born from the ashes? Will I have healed? My scars are real, and they will fade. But my heart is preserved in these many pages I stain with ink. And last one from Chaos is Moonbow. The city is dead, I scream into the night. If they're always watching, then why don't I start performing? Obviously, they're searching for the great and brilliant to shine through. Tortured, rotten, and brave. A real and true piece of art. Fear be gone. Fear be gone. All right. And into reverse cycle repeat. I'll show a little cover of the, of the chaos of Tao as well. Oh, yeah. Camera over here. Oh, wait, I know I had it right the first time. <laughs> I can't figure out the orientation. Ah, there it is. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll read the back of this one. I present round two in the years of seeking truth. What lies within embodies both Zen and turmoil. There's no one way to describe what I feel inside, so I'll let these words speak for themselves. Enjoy the passion of the moment and settling into peace. Reversing a cycle only asks for more. So what's the point? Whatever happens, we will live on, embellishing this fantasy called life. Emotions alive through cycles we die. This is fine, for we may be reborn many times. 
<laughs> oh, thanks. That wasn't even a poem. <laughs> Aquarius. Thick snow falls gently, a pillowy blanket of love. Test the mind within to express the heart. Don't let your face fall, drop, let go. Chase oneself, but don't forget to think about others. The mysterious Aquarius misleading. Deny us and we'll laugh. Try to stop us and we'll rebel. Give it your best shot. Our souls are free. Love soars through the wind. We keep the fire alive through the frozen air of winter. Melt snow off the roofs. Catch, catch water in a kettle. Boil it hot. Water bearer now. Make a pot of tea. <laughs> I was able to make a uh, a poem about Aquarius, which is an air sign about water, about tea. Yeah. <laughs> Poetic license. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Self published. I can do what I want. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Belief. It's too brilliant, too immersive. It's too caught by the fragrance of the leaf that shows me the wisdom of the day and the symphonies at night become the darker dreams no longer meant to share the life within. Fragrance upon fragrance, book by book inspiring, seamless leaves bursting out. Fragments of fragrance, dust to dust and ashes, today, now, leaves twirl in wonder. Kiss the shoulders of structures on the way in, adapt to the space, move in to a grin. It's slow, it's nature at work. I have a little sip of tea before I read this next one. Hmm. It's called She Smiled, I Saw. Dark, dreary days drag on for years. Morning brew delivered straight, no emotion, just fact. I've dreamt of better times, yearning to see her spark. Just a touch of life more than simplified service gestures. Can I make her laugh? No joy to be found here. Funky coffee shop, guarded customer interactions. New to town like the place, saddened by straight face but buried beneath plastic and fabric. Someday we'll be better. I know we'll break through. Coffee shop community is the center of a town. Don't expect much, take your drink and go. Strangers don't talk now, they might catch a cold. Come a day when fear is lifted, then society may return. For it is fear that does drive a half-life lived behind masks. Remove the veil, show your face. Fear is gone with the law. Expose ourselves again. Night shift ends in daylight. Time for a fresh brew. Walk inside confident. A new day, a new world appears. I can see her face, all of it. Eyes relax, they almost sparkle. Enthused as always, I make my order. Finally interested in a stranger, she reciprocates. And by God, the most terrific thing, I saw her smile. This I know because I can see her lips. She smiled. The gladness washes through my body. I take my coffees and leave. As I open the door into the world less divided, threshold between indoors and out, tears stream down my face. We sm she smiled. We are free. I don't know if that one needs much explanation, but I will anyway. <laughs> in 2021, the day when the mask mandates were lifted, mm -hmm. that was a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Remember me. The people who I write poetry about are often the ones who pass through my life. Honestly, it is strange to write about someone close, someone here and here to stay. What does it mean, this change? What does it mean to write about those away? Write them away, write them away. Is there a love in that art, or am I wishing them off? Cast a spell, hold my wand, I keep their memory alive. The emotion I pour out onto page, onto screen, and over and over again. I think they're still here, wherever they are. I hope they love with a love like I love. I hope they hold these words with joy. Heart to heart and all in between. Be well, be strong, dear friends. I remember you, the same goes for me. I write, so you'll remember me. Mm. 
And this next one is about a little interaction with a poet friend who apologized for being awkward when we saw each other earlier. Poet's language. Do not fear the wind that grasps the air from our lungs, swallowing the words we never really had. See the truth in a smile, a wave from afar. That is the poet's language. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this one's called 12.07 AM, Ode to, Je to Jesse McPhee. Somebody's life is changing tonight. Do you ever think about that? Something is always happening somewhere and somebody's life is changing tonight. In the dark while the rest of us sleep, others are out. The night continues on like the day. Lots to do, lots to say. Expect any kind of exchange. Throw a beat or throw a punch, restless shadows under lamplight. A peaceful kid on a scooter, a prowling man on a lonely bicycle, going nowhere, lurking, doesn't know why he's awake. But the night goes on, no flicker of danger. They are the danger, anyone who has normalized the night. Look out, look out, while nothing goes on, the barren streets living dead. I, uh, I titled that poem for the moment that I actually finished writing it. I just finished work and I just felt this urge to pull over and write a poem. I always keep a journal on me for moments like that. And um, I just had this like big feeling to write this. And then a few days later, I found out that I'd written that a day or two after a friend of mine had actually died. And it was like I felt really connected to him after that. Uh, so I then I retitled it to be an ode to him. About this time two years ago. I've been debating on reading this one, but I think I'm going to, because I do kind of actually want to. Um, but I, I think I, I, I should actually um, offer a trigger warning, quite literally, um, having to do with uh, mental health, suicidal thoughts. Well, voila. <laughs> Silence got shot dead with a memory. Hold the gun, aim forward, rewind. The gun slips from my hand, face ahead, take a chance. If I looked her in the eyes, I would tell her to listen closely to my silence. The piercing wails of the void would echo through her demented ears, and she would drown in the inside of her mental tomb. Silence is fear, the pen is a gun, loaded and ready with ink. Mask hanging tight on my face, you'll never see my lips move. Your spell I cannot smell. Plugs hidden in my ears, thick hair covers like walls. Maybe this is what it was all for. But I'll keep it all to myself. Your pervasive scowl will growl and howl till I believe that you're better than me. See this gun in my hand? I won't shoot you. I'll turn the barrel around. Dark thoughts only seize when the, when the gun is pointed at me. Yes. Look in the eyes and shoot myself. The truth disappears with my soul. Twisted and broken becomes beautiful, for dark words are not spoken at a funeral. My body laid in a bed of flowers. So this is the, so the end is this, there is no end, I will forever haunt. From afar without words, silence is death. Through death, my silence is heard. You killed me, you put me through hell. That trembling existence is no more. Instinct to live. I never had the instinct to die. When things are hard, to take my life and leave them all behind. I never had the instinct to die. I knew how to move on, drop the pain, get away. I'm not from here, somewhere else is always home. If this doesn't work, I'll find somewhere new. There was hope. A poet with a dark demeanor, blood curling sing screams of singers, those made me feel alive. I've got the instinct to live, survival of the determined, paired with a wildly active imagination. <laughs> writer's gut. Just move with the pen. Just move with it. Like you're underwater and you see algae dancing, all in a rhythmic pattern, together and individual, like the many movements of authors before you who have given the pen a real go. It doesn't have to be a spirit guide, a medium through which one communicates is the pen. Most often it is, and it's more. 
It's the knowing deep inside, the painful gut instinct, the bludgeoning self-control required to manifest a, a project, comply to the victories of being original. If it doesn't save the world, it's saving you. Balance your life enough to keep your fire alive. The guide lovingly asking you to practice in that smirks and insults you about your fear of rejection. <laughs> The illusion. Snow sweeping off of tall pines graces my eyes. If this is the big illusion, then I really don't mind. <laughs> if it is, it's a beautiful illusion. Thank you, Rochelle. That was great. <laughs> Wonderful poetry and, and lots, uh, lots of food for thought in there. And you took us to some very interesting places, some <laughs> dark, some very light, uh, all great variety. Beautiful. So I want to open Thank it you. up if anybody has any questions they want to ask Rochelle out there in Zoom land or here live at Char's. Um, if you're here at Char's, you can put your hand up or holler at me and uh, shout it out and I'll repeat it for everybody out in Zoom land. And in Zoom land, just unmute yourself and get our attention. <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm going to start it off by just saying, um, you know, I, I feel that spiritual thread through all of your stuff. And do you want to just talk a little bit about the connection between spirituality and, and your writing? Like you, hmm. yeah. Um, how do I say Oh no, it's a lot. <laughs> it's yeah. like uh I don't know, just when when I have a feeling about something it needs to go onto page and like there's no short way to describe just deep thoughts. So mm -hmm. um I don't know, it's 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 it, it, cuz writing poetry is something different than writing a letter and it's this it's just this way of expressing something like deeper and Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. that, that, putting the words beside the words that are on the page themselves but. yeah yeah <laughs> your poetry says it all anyway you don't really <laughs> <laughs> but i also like all, part of the journey too is uh, in, in terms of publishing is like to actually put the poem the arrange the the words on the page mm. the way that i would be or should be expressing them yeah. too like so the way I've, i put it onto the page helps me to just peek at it and understand the, my my sense of pace and the emotion and the yeah. pauses and etc. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. Another whole dimension to it to read it on the page and 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 mind you, you kind of honor that when you read it, but it's it's better when you can see it. Too, so. <laughs> Probably, yeah. It's to help the reader a little bit. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll vote for that. Uh, <laughs> all right. Oh, we got a question over here, Jeremy. Jeremy. Yes. About that. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I actually, uh, I was actually going to go into some poems from the newer book, but that's just not uh, in, in, in print yet. So it's on my phone. So I actually had intended a few more, but I don't know where my time was at. So I yeah. just took the natural end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it, it felt right. And your time was just, just right. It was, it was okay. good. but that's good. You got another one coming up. So when you get that new book out, we can do a launch here at Char's. That would be fabulous. Uh, that's quite possible. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, last chance for questions. Otherwise, okay. We're going to give a big round of applause again to Rochelle. Thank you so much for sharing your work. Thank you. Thank you very much. And a reminder that her books are available on Amazon. If you're not in Port Alberni, if you're in Port Alberni, come to Mecca anytime or down at the market. Or I can mail them out and stuff too. Yes, there we go. I'll, I'll, when the third one is out, you can do a whole bundle and, and order all three of them together. Perfect. <laughs> yes, cheaper by the bunch. Cheaper uh, by the dozen. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, Risha. Okay, yeah. Another reply. All righty, we're going to zip out into Zoom land now and go to Gibson's Landing where David Kipling is reclining on the couch, much looking much too comfortable. So, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll give him a prod. We'll get him unmuted. There, there we go. Okay. All right, get out of the way.
Evening, David. Hey, I got the camera, as long as you can see some of my head. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is a, a short story. Uh, the slate grey horizon tilted, and with it, Agnesia's stomach. The instant the ferry passed the massive sea wall at Rotterdam's harbour entrance and met the full force of the North Sea. Her two sweaters, the cashmere polo neck, duty free from a crossing last year, and soft, under one of those raw wool indestructibles that her grandma knitted, these protected Agnieszka as she clambered down the steel rungs from a semi-trailer's cab. She gripped her oilskin haversack and ran for the shelter of the passenger corridor. Now behind her, the North Sea's growing autumn gale stripped paper and wood and nameless waste from the battered deck and flicked streaks of sea foam around the trucks. The heavy vehicles strained and creaked, against the tie-down straps that shackled them to the deck. Agnieszka glanced back once to confirm that the running light on a refrigerated trailer was green, then walked onto the canteen. Through the warmth and mist of the canteen, she spotted the Irish twins, already demolishing their plates of pie and potato. Aggie called one through his mouthful, over here, and beckoned with a fork full of pie crust. She'd christened them the Irish twins, though they weren't twins or even brothers, but from Connemara, so they'd be Catholic, wouldn't they? Agnieszka had 30 tons of Polish bacon on her truck for delivery to a Birmingham wholesaler. After that, her dispatcher had given her an empty run to pick up a trailer of farm tractors for shipment to the outskirts of Liège in Belgium. She was usually last into a canteen. She'd made it a comforting habit to first check her truck's lights and dials and make notes in her log. Then she would slowly rotate her neck and shoulders against the heavy canvas seat back and rub antiseptic cream on her hands. One look at her tired eyes, highway eyes, she called them, in the mirror, and finally she kissed her fingertips to the photograph of her two children, Lily and Mika, held by a bulldog clip to the rim of her dashboard. Outside, her boots kicked the stout wooden chocks under the wheels. Only then was it canteen time. Walking past the Irish twins, Agnieszka tapped the table and said, Keep my place. Please, God, they cleaned the washrooms today, she muttered. On night sailings, in bad weather, with short crews, this low-budget ferry line often let cleanliness go to the devil. Agnieszka was not the only driver who brought their own toilet paper. Cold water for her face and hot for her hands made Agnieszka fit for food. But beside the food counter, her boots skidded a couple of inches as the ferry took a massive wave on the starboard beam. This German shipping line's canteen had food for most European tastes, but experienced drivers heading onto a North Sea, into a North Sea crossing in poor weather chose potatoes and the plainest of pies. Agnieszka took a tray across to the twins, who were already wiping off their plates with bread. Then he grinned. Welcome to the Ritz Dining Lounge, Aggie. Agnieszka checked her watch. Ten hours to docking in Hull, and the weather did not promise much rest. Her body unexpectedly jammed against the table edge, and she gripped her plate and cup. Son of a you-know-what, whispered Lenny through a forced smile. He patted his pockets for cigarettes and strode unsteadily for the exit. You won't find many places to light up, Max shook his head. They've roped off the top decks, and that truck deck's like a wind tunnel tonight. The worsening pitch and roll of the old ferry, barely an hour out and nowhere near the treacherous middle stretch, had drivers and crew faking their smiles. A cannon boom shook the steel bulkhead and made them all jump. Valentino, at his grill, shrugged. We all die, right? My wife, she be happy. My lousy son, you get my car. I go to hell, everybody happy. Nobody laughed. Agnieszka squeezed her eyes shut. She had asked, had actually demanded a dispatcher in Wroclaw to assign her this run to give her eight days straight. That overtime pay, plus the overnight allowances she retained by sleeping in the cab, plus selling duty free when she got home, would pay for a week with Lily and Mika at the little resort outside Wroclaw, the one with the children's farm and the water slide. She had asked for this run and now felt a chill. Now the world dropped beneath her boots as a giant swell fell away from under the ferry and she felt a brief unnatural acceleration as it slid down to smash into the mountain of the next wave. Some drivers had left the canteen to wash their fear at the railings 
propping themselves in corners against brackets, facing the marching walls of grey water that filled half the world. Agnieszka felt an urge to run back to a truck and check the kid's photo and say something to them up there in her safe car. The speakers blared again. Nobody is to remain in their vehicle. If you're in your vehicle, leave now and muster on the half deck where the green light is flashing. Half deck where the green light is flashing. A crewman pushed past a table, cursing that the worst had happened. A truck had broken loose. A fully loaded 60-foot steel carrier had snapped its tie-downs. And despite its brakes, the tilting wet deck was shifting the mat massive articulated truck bodily sideways. Agnieszka knew what could happen. A loose truck was uncatchable, and if it tangled others, especially with dangerous cargoes, it could put the ship itself in peril. Any skipper had the authority to open the steel doors and simply let a runaway truck or any entangled cargo fall into a following sea. Agnieszka knew a Latvian who had lost his truck and 50 tons of mining machinery into the Baltic just 10 kilometers out of Helsinki. Mika and Lily's photo in the cab. The two would be smiling towards her empty driver's seat. No, not completely empty. Agnieszka's scarf was still in there, draped over the headrest. The kids could see it, she imagined, and perhaps they could even smell her driving sweat and her occasional dabs of perfume. Lots for her kids to see and be with, if they were looking, and if they were there at this moment. The speaker started up again but a piercing scrap of metal obliterated all other sounds and the deck beneath Agnieszka's feet moved eerily sideways. A wall of cold air puffed through the canteen and threw open every door. Agnieszka gritted her teeth and ran for the truck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Oh, nail biter there, David. Thank you. <laughs> where, where did the inspiration for that come from? Can I ask? Uh, well, uh, t t there were two things actually. Many, many of the fifty years ago in England, when things were very old-fashioned, and I was on the on the freeway, and um, I was being passed by a big semi-trailer rig. And you know, fifty years ago, everyone driving a semi-trailer was an Englishman who wore coveralls and a shirt and tie and a cap. Yeah. And driving this big Mercedes was an ordinary woman in an ordinary sweater, which I noticed. And it had a Polish registration. And the other thing was that uh, I knew a, a truck driver who told me that he had been, he crossed on the North Sea uh, on a ferry where they had opened the door and let two trucks fall off. Wow. Because it was simply two, they were broken loose and there was nothing you could do. So they opened the steel doors and let the trucks fall off and the insurance pays for it. Wow. So there's, there's a probably, they, they estimate trucks and containers. I mean, I checked it up. There's probably in the average year between one and 2,000 containers and trucks are jettisoned by ships, freight mm -hmm. ships around the world. It's part, it's part it's the cost of business. Wow. Um, anyway, that's, that was the inspiration. <laughs> I don't know what it's about yet. It's about that terrible fear. Mm -hmm. She shouldn't have been on that run. She said, give me another day. Because mm -hmm. yeah. she's got the kids, yeah. and then what's happened? We yeah. don't know. <laughs> wow, beautiful, well written too. Thank you so much. Thank that, was, you. that was great, David. All right, we're going to go over to Germany now, and we're going to have a ten-minute spotlight on on Leslie Omohandro Bronskowski. And Leslie, what are you going to share with us? You got a full ten minutes. Are you going to do a long story or several pieces? What's on the board? No, um, I have two pieces here, and they're both about my grandmother. Um, um, one is a memory from my childhood, and the other one is a memory from when she was I was grown and she was in a, obviously much older. And um, it wasn't really until she was old that I understood that um, she had always lived with pain. I thought she was just racist or full of hate. Um, but when she really got old, and you know, would talk to me sometimes. Then I sort of thought, oh my God, she's been living with pain for you know all these years. She was, I think, ninety six when she died. So the first one is a story from my childhood. It's just called. It's one of my memory stories. It's just called Memory Number Twenty Three. My grandmother from Long Island in New York, who has white legs and lives in a big house 
says that people like us with light skin and good hair are second cousins to white people, which means we're the same family. She says things like she wouldn't sit down at the same table with a dark skinned person, even if they are blood. Blood does not mean that you're family. She walks in her house without looking at the dark skinned neighbors so they won't think she is issuing them an invitation to stop by. Although Aunt Cora has come in all the way from New York City, my grandmother does not invite her to stay for dinner. She cannot go into the living room as this is for guests. This aunt from our mother's side, who is our grandfather's sister, can sit in the kitchen and sip a cup of cold tea. We hear her ask where the children are. She waits for us to come out of our rooms and say hello. We stiffly embrace her and ask if we can leave. She says we have grown so much this last year. We do not want the baby toys she has brought us as presents. We know we will not be punished for being rude. Later, my grandmother and I sit together at the kitchen table. She has made us a pot of peppermint tea. I know something is coming when she puts down her spoon and looks at me. I can tell she's been waiting for this moment. She reaches into her apron pocket and pulls out the dish rag that she used five minutes ago to wipe the table off and wipes the corner of her mouth in slow motion. She still has a trace of red on her finger from where she dyed her hair this morning. You know, she says, I have four grandchildren and one monkey. She holds her spoon in midair and stares into space. She has red on her ear too. You can tell, she says, lowering her voice to a whisper by looking at the gums. I watch my grandmother run her tongue along her gums. Now you and me, we got pink gums, which means we're human beings, she says. Dark people got black gums, like the monkeys. She takes her wedding picture out of her apron pocket and holds it out to me. In her white dress, she stands unsmiling next to her new husband. He is wearing a black tuxedo and white gloves. He looks sleek and elegant. His hair is shaved short and his light eyes are laughing directly into the camera. His eyes draw me in like magnets. Like his sister, he is big boned and black, the color of coal like his sister. He may have been a brown skinned man, but he had the prettiest white teeth and the pinkest gums you ever saw, she says. Everybody knew it too. Ain't no monkeys on our side of the family, she says, just so you know. And now my grandmother is old and something else happened. And this is a story I wrote about her and I guess about us called The House of Her Childhood. She saw the house of her childhood then, exactly there where the old lady had said it would be. A little more rundown maybe than the old lady had said, and it wasn't really white. More gray, she thought, but it was the house. Funny, she thought, that it's here today. Or maybe now she too had started to believe in it. Maybe now she too understood why this house had to be the way the old lady had always understood. Maybe everybody needs something to believe in, she thought. For a second, Jim came into her mind, Huck Finn's friend who had believed so hard in, her, in his hairball to tell the future. She almost smiled at the comparison until she remembered who Jim was. She even saw the blue door that the older brother, the one from the first marriage, had painted every year new and the window that had never shut right. Although he repaired it a hundred times, the old lady had said, at least it's the climate here, you know, here you can work as hard as a white man, and even then you don't get nowhere. Here even the whites think they black from all the hard work that gets them nowhere. She had known that the old lady wasn't sleeping, even though she had closed her eyes. That had always been her way, even back then, before she understood that she didn't have to be afraid. At some point, if you look closely, you could see her shoulders moving and the glow in her eyes even though they were closed. 
It was harder to hear the sound, that silent chuckling that never seemed to want to stop. He, 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 he. Back then she had thought that she would explode the old lady if she didn't take a breath. How can you laugh from the inside? She had tried it once herself, but the sound came out so loud that she jumped. She knew if she went around the house, she'd find the old pump too. Today, not even the older brother could move that handle, but back then when it was a warm summer, and it was always a warm summer, they had held the babies right under the pump and washed off the blood. Back then, did nobody go all through that drama of hospitals and hygiene? Didn't have them know how and didn't know baby die, except Clara, of course, but that was appendix. And only then cause she fell from the mule and it broke. And at eight, she wasn't no baby no more anyhow. Not in the real sense. Somehow it made her cry when she thought about it. They held them under a pump to bring them into the world. And well water is always cold, even in the summer. She knew that. But even that couldn't harden them for life. Wasn't there anything you could do? Back then, when the old lady had told her the story of Clara for the first time, she cried too. Maybe because she was a child and always cried when something hurt. Sometimes even when she was reading a novel and somebody died, she had to put the book down and cover her face behind her hands and just cry. You silly goose, the old lady had said when she saw that. You stupid silly goose. You got to sit there and cry? She didn't answer. Even back then, she had learned where that would get you. Even as a child, she knew that. You think that hurts? You call that pain? That little ache you call in pain? Should I tell you what pain really is? You're the silly goose she'd wanted to answer. You're the silly, stupid, unfeeling goose who can't even admit when it hurts. You don't even know how to laugh. Let me tell you, and you mind what I say. Pain is pain when it hurts for 90 years. 90 years, child. One day less, and it ain't no pain. She remembered that now. She had thought about it a lot, all through the years, now and again. Really only then, when everything was over and almost forgotten, when only the memory remained of what had been and nothing more. Then she remembered the old lady and thought she had been right after all back then. Funny, she thought that she knew. Sometimes when she thought about it, she would have liked to have asked the old lady how it was that she knew and if pain really existed anywhere at all here on this earth, she couldn't think of anything. The old lady looked at her. Child, she asked, do you know I've started flying? She smiled. Just get in the plane and go. Yeah, shopping and stuff. I still, that, still do that with the car. But for everything else, I just get in the plane and go. Yeah, she said, sounds nice. You can come visit me. The old lady looked at her. You probably think the sky is blue. Is that what you think? Yeah, she said. And clouds are white? Yeah, she said. Because you don't fly, child. Because you just don't fly. The old lady went still and closed her eyes. You know, I flew to the moon once, all the way to the moon. Not alone, of course, no, not alone. We were a whole group. It was, she looked at her and tried to look her in the eyes, but she kept them closed. It was like, what can I tell you? A reception, child, they were so nice to us. It was like we were white and they were the slaves. She waited. Child, she said quietly so that she could hardly hear her. I was free for a day. In all these years, 
I was free for a day. She waited, but the old lady didn't open her eyes again. She wanted to laugh out loud and say how she was really happy for her or something like that. Maybe she could take her along next time. She'd always wanted to go to the moon, you know. If only she would laugh. She stood up and left. Silly goose, she thought. Stupid, silly goose. At the door, she stopped and stared across the field. It was then that she saw the house of her childhood, right there where the old lady had said it would be. She stood still and didn't even dare to wipe her eyes, as though she knew she'd lose it if she looked away, even for an instant. So that was it, and that was a, a true story that my grandmother really told me um, when she was over, way over 90. Beautiful. That was mesmerizing, absolutely mesmerizing. What a character study that was. That was wonderful. Thank you for taking us on that journey, Leslie. That was amazing. <laughs> Where am I? Am I sure? Yeah. Okay. okay. Wow. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Get some sleep now so you can teach your students in the morning, okay? <laughs> no, tomorrow's my free day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. Works out perfectly. Thank you for sharing that. All right, uh, we're going to go to Ontario now, and Jennifer is there going to share some poetry with us this evening. Good evening, good evening. Jennifer. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, good, good. Looking forward um, to hearing some more of your words. Quick reminder, the book is out there. Um, Carl will post a link, and you can find all the info from there. Yeah. Um, I'm going – I thought I would do a, a bunch of – tiny newer things um, tonight. Uh, so the first one is called Strata. Under a luring cloud bank, pure blind cars drone by on the elevated road. Down there, a once thriving pond is trapped in mortal combat with invading Phragmites. Most of my haiku is done in sets. This one is kind of a loner at the moment. Maybe a couple of others will join it, uh, but it's called Rose. Red rose gazing up, a thirst for precious drops, gift from far off ocean. And um, some of my haiku triptychs. Uh, the first one is called Three Haiku for Warbler Woods. Uh, Warbler Woods is a patch of forest, just a stone's throw from where I live on the west side of London. And uh, it one time it had been slated for development, but it got saved, so it's still there. It's lovely. One, undulating path through vernal awakening, trillium cordon. Two, Still unseen souls watch, nebulous feeling explode, there, deer flash away. Three, winged concerto rides woodpecker percussion, silencing footfalls. Uh, three haiku for a quiet tra trail. This goes back to sort of childhood memories down near my grandparents' cottage at Turkey Point, Long Point Bay and Lake Erie. One, up lakeside sand hill. This time, follow Woods Trail and find a golf course green. Two, onward alone near cliff, each step an adventure, skirt poison ivy. Three, gently up and down, tracking unseen view. Then seized, sparkling waves, boats, birds. And this one's pretty self-explanatory. Three haiku for the backyard in August. One, distinct buzzes all round, zip line down from the oaks, unseen cicadas. Two, 
humidity cloak enfolds inescapable thunderstorm coming. Three, more plops from above, acorn searching for bed, then reawakening. And a spot that I visited some years ago, and th this is what this one is, three haiku for Acadia National Park, way out in Maine. One, scale precipice by ladders, rungs, and skinny ledge, descend easy way. Two, quiet byways, once tycoons, car-free carriage lanes, now plebeians ride. Three, grueling seaside hillcrest rewards with hidden treasure, blueberries. And finally, three haiku for a childhood neighborhood, which actually isn't very far from where I am now. One, school's out, kids elsewhere, playground's lonely, but for me, breathing in quiet. Two, phantom orchard once smiled on this solitary's guileless grasps and swings. Three, sporting a bucket, our maple slowly donates Sylvan Elixir. Thank you. Thank you. I just yeah, I love those short poems that take such small images or you know such compressed images and force us to just really hone in on them and feel that little shift that happens in the third line. It's beautiful. Thank you. And especially Thank you. Ones, the ones from around Lake Erie there really took me back to my childhood. My you Boy, know, I wondered if you'd remember some of them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer, as always. Beautiful stuff. Okay. And we're going to go back to Gibson's Landing now, and Kathleen is going to share some prose with us, I'm guessing, as usual. Oh, oh well, I'm going to Oh my goodness, what an evening. It's been fantastic. But yeah. I think it's time. I just want to escape to the more reassuring world of murder and garden <laughs> clubs. <laughs> yeah, please yeah. take us there. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to finish it. I'm going to finish it. Okay. Um, I'll repeat a little bit so we get a mood. I had a terrible premonition as I got out of my car and could hear heavy machinery. I raced around to the back of the house. My lovely garden was surrounded by, in crime tape with flags to mark spots of special interest. Flags that were sprouting everywhere and looked just like the invading yellow irises that are threatening local habitat. Every bed had been uprooted and police were everywhere sifting through the soil that diggers had overturned. What have you done to my garden? I screamed at the detective. Not what I have done. It's what you have done. Petunia knew, didn't she? Petunia, your best friend, the only one who was peering at your slide so intently that she saw the jaded, braceleted arm, the color of moss. Hallie loved green, didn't she? I was aghast. I am a master gardener. Everything in my garden is done properly. It must have been that dog from next door. I knew pet-friendly gardening would be a mistake. I should have planted oleander, lily of the valley, and azaleas, and left out some nice fresh tulip bulbs for Bowser to munch on. But if you had only come to me first, Inspector, I would have confessed rather than see my beautiful garden destroyed. I have no regrets except for Petunia. The others were neither use nor ornament, only good for compost. Petunia may have been common, but for me she was a rarity, a true friend. Gardening is not for the faint of heart, Inspector, and it can make the gardeners themselves self-obsessed, competitive, and cutthroat. That's why garden clubs need discipline and pruning. Need I remind you that I am president of the club for a reason? <laughs> you never let me forget that you're president, which is good because that's how I knew it had to be you. 
It's a simple case of qui bono. To whom is it a benefit? Oh, officer, you speak Latin, the language of plants. We could have been such great friends, I exclaimed, wiping a tear from my eye. <laughs> I was investigating the murder of Petunia and disappearances of Amaryllis, B, Holly, and Timothy, and I had identified a different person who would benefit from the murder of each one. However, as president of the Garden Club, you were the only person who would benefit from all the murders. I only did it for the club officer, I said as he led me away. I know, he answered ever so kindly. <laughs> Master gardeners have to be a tough lot. What with weeds, pests, and soil depletion, we are not easily discouraged. You know, officer, it's been proven that group gardening encourages socialization in a safe atmosphere. Just the ticket for where I'm going. I could propose a prison garden if they don't have one already. I could even start a garden club. I could become the president. <laughs> the end. There were lots of applause up there. That's it. Oh, I love your sense of humor. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, I can see the garden club happening now in prison. <laughs> <laughs> and they're digging up the corner and it's becoming a, a trench full of bodies. <laughs> Thank you, Kathleen, as always entertaining. Uh, and we're moving, we're coming to Shars Landing now in house. We've got a Shauna coming all the way from beautiful Sprout Lake, tore herself away from the the cool, refreshing water. Come in and share some words with us tonight. Welcome, Shauna. Good call. Can we get it along? Yes, Whew, awesome poetry tonight. So intense and yeah, yeah, an amazing feature. I loved the wording in the feature about the the Tao and the turmoil. I think it was. I just love that. And Leslie's line about the ninety years of pain. I think she just like, oh, I'm still processing that. So, yeah, really amazing. Um, my poem tonight that I wanted to share started flowing a few months ago when I was out having coffee in the morning. And your question, Derek, about like poetry being spiritual, for me, it's very spiritual. It, I find that it's a release for my, or the, it brings together the perspective of my human experiences, my everyday human experiences, the pains, the joys, everything, but with a broader perspective. So this one definitely is that. And it felt like a message for me when it flowed because I just couldn't get it out fast enough. But hopefully it's a message for everybody. And the poem uses a little bit more traditional wording. So depending on your own beliefs, this wording is very interchangeable. Um, but what isn't interchangeable is the essence and the message, which is in the title. And the title of this poem is called the forever lovable. We are all creations of the divine. No matter how deeply we forget. No matter how deeply we regret. No matter how often or how much we get upset. No matter if we throw tantrums when we are unable to get. No matter if we make mistakes, the one truth will never forsake. We're all creations of the divine, sparks of the flame, unable to smother and tame, no one higher than the other. We were all created in his image and likeness the same. The imprint on our soul is his name. I am that I am. 
affirm it with conviction. There are no conditions, no matter the loss of faith when faced with affliction, no matter the human mind condition, full of misinterpretations and miscreations, we are bound only by our own misperceptions. For the human mind, no matter how well-intentioned, puts conditions on the holy again and again, sermon after sermon, condemnation of sin. Oh, so many have gotten it wrong. There is no condemnation from God. Condemnation is not law. Condemnation is man-made, fear-made, illusion-made. There is no debt to pay. The divine loves us all, no matter what. An inconceivable truth for the human mind, no matter what. Whether or not we can love our own selves the same way when we go astray, this is yet a whole other quest. When we look in the mirror and detest what we see because we do not feel good enough or worthy enough to be who the divine created us to be. The walk through the valley of the shadow of death is not a test, but a way, a gift, for us to learn how to love our own selves the same way, unconditionally, no matter what. This, I believe, is a basis of all there is to believe when it comes to you and me. Love thyself, love thyself, love thyself, no matter what. The highest of all aims, for in each one of us is God, no matter the name. The name doesn't matter. It's the path that leads to the same. The creator, the great excavator, the heavenly father, the divine source, the light, the love. Do not look to the above. Look to the kingdom within. So I bring my heirs to the light. I am no longer ashamed to reveal my internal fight, nor am I ashamed to stand tall in my light. That's like a seed in the ground, being ashamed to crack open and reach for the light. How ludicrous that would be. The seed is the same as you and me. We must each remember who we are destined to be. So embrace the process it takes to break out of the shell. Our walk back to heaven comes after our own walk through hell. And how can I speak so certain of this? Because I have entered hell many a times. Not a place created or threatened by divine, but a state created within our own state of mind right here on earth. From internalizing the lies that followed our birth, the symbolic fire created first within me all of the times when I felt anything less than worthy to be. An inflamed mind leads to an inflamed body. Inflammation is nothing more than being inflamed from the anger that rises out of the acceptance of shame when the finger came down on us and filled us with blame. This was the original wound. This was the very first scar. A dagger to the heart that led to the forgetting of who and all that we are. The perfect design. Fate meant to pull us into the darkness of a disconnected mind so we could become like the seed and take the journey of growing and reaching and breaking free to start us off on the greatest journey we will ever take. We are not, and will never be, a blank slate. We are not, and will never be, a blank slate. We are the eternal, the universal, the controversial, the spiritual, the powerful, the multidimensional, the intentional, the indiminishable, the imperishable, the original, the untouchable the forever lovable, no matter what. Thank you. Well said and well delivered, beautiful. When when that kind of passion meets that kind of conviction, it creates a beautiful poetry and you, you did it all. That was fabulous, thank you.
Thank you. I love the great excavator. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, we got the next year. Oh, we've got our Port Alberni zone. Vicki Drybro is up again. Going to bring us some more of her beautiful work. Poetry or short story or part of the novel or creative nonfiction. She does it all. <laughs> oh, yay. I think that's pretty good. Great. Okay. Um, I don't have any grandmas or um, haiku for you, just a father with an axe. My father is chopping wood and I am loading the wheelbarrow. He bends over and flings the wood into the wheelbarrow, sometimes without even watching where it lands. When it is heaped up so it can't hold one more piece, he grabs the handles and rolls it down the path to the woodshed, pieces tumbling off the sides into the grass. I follow behind, picking them up as they fall. The first time I load the wheelbarrow, I try flinging the pieces in, but he tells me to stop. You're making a mess, he says. Don't throw them. Place them so they're even weight. Not too much in the front and not too much in the back. Well, that's not the way you were doing it. Yeah, well, I know, but that's not the proper way to do it. Do it like I told you. The other way looks like more fun. Why does everything have to be fun? Whack. The axe slices through another round. This is hard work. It's not supposed to be fun. Mom, Sam, and I had fun when we used to chop wood back when my father worked in Vancouver. My mother is very good at chopping wood. When I got home from working at the phone office all night, I would chop wood for the kitchen stove, she told us. I would pretend I was chopping the heads off all the disagreeable people I had to deal with that night. <laughs> Didn't your dad help you? I asked. He was wounded in the war. He couldn't do any physical labor. What about grandma? Asked Sam. She wasn't up yet. Sam grabbed the axe and shouted out a name every time it sliced through the wood. Mr. Nuttall, Mrs. Cranston, old lady Bellamy. They were the names of his teachers. I had to think hard of an adult's head I'd like to chop off. Herbie Jones, I shouted as Sam swung the axe. He always splashed people on the road when he roared by in his beat up old truck. Sam and mom laughed. Sam lifted the axe again. Just as he let it fall, I shouted, Dad! <laughs> the piece flew off the chopping block, somersaulted, and smacked into my leg. <laughs> Serves you right! Sam dropped the axe and bent over double, shaking with laughter. Even Mum burst out laughing. I stood there not knowing what to do. My leg stung really bad. At first, I thought they were laughing because I got hit like the kids at school would do. Then I realized it was because I had said dad, and it was like he reached all the way from Vancouver to punish me. It was kind of funny, but I never called out his name again. Okay. Like my father told me, I packed the wheelbarrow with wood, placing all the pieces in the same direction, layer after layer, until there isn't any more room. He pushes it down the path all the way to the woodshed, and no pieces fall off. Then I begin to pass them to him so he can stack them neatly inside. He likes to store things neatly. The tool shed is next to the woodshed. It is full of tools hanging from hooks or wedged behind two old two-by-fours nailed across the whitewashed walls. I have no business being in there so I hardly ever go in. Except for last week, when I took a handful of nails and the new hammer, I needed them to build my new fort. I put the hammer back, but the jar of nails looked a little empty, even though I shook it to cover up the empty places. I am helping my father with the wood today, 
so he will be pleased with me and not suspect me if he notices the missing nails. After loading and stacking wood for a long time, I am so tired I just want to lie down on the grass. I don't want to make my father angry, but I can hardly lift another piece. Just when I'm going to say I have to go to the bathroom, my mother appears. Time to take a break, she says. My father stops chopping, upends two more rounds of wood for my mother and me to sit on. We all sit down, and she passes a mug of hot tea to my father and a glass of chocolate milk to me. There are still small globs of chocolate powder floating on the top. She fishes in her pocket and hands me a dad's cookie. Where's yours? asks my father, holding up his tea. Oh, I had a cup earlier. That means that she and Sam have had a talk. I wonder what's wrong this time. My father doesn't get the connection. After I finish my milk, I go into the house, flop on my bed, and fall asleep. When the kitchen door slams, I wake up to see Sam striding up the path to the road. I wonder what's going on, so I go to find my mother. She is sitting on the big flat rock, staring at the ocean. What's wrong with Sam? I sit down next to her, but she doesn't answer right away. You know what he's like when he's in a bad mood. Almost as scary as my father. No matter what I say, he just yells at me. Sometimes he throws things. What did he do? He was rude to Hetty. I wonder why Sam would be rude to Miss Pennyfield. She is a little old lady who has two beautiful cats and lives in a small house full of paintings. Did he apologize? Apparently, he wasn't very convincing. What did Dad say? He doesn't know, so keep it to yourself. At dinner, my father does most of the talking. When he asks where Sam is, my mother is vague. He's said something about going to Mike's. They're roasting hot dogs over a fire. My father grunts, and my mother and I exchange glances. It seems we all have things we don't want my father to know about. <laughs> Thank you, Vicki, as always. Mesmerizing, spellbinding storytelling. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're moving on. We've got uh, Joe Lunchbucket here in uh, Shars Landing going to share some poetry, I'm guessing, with us again this evening. Come on up, and you're going to have to stretch that microphone up there, Kyle. It's, yeah, yeah, way to the clouds, yeah. There we go. How are you tonight, Bob? How was that? That's good. That's good, yeah. Okay. We can hear you. Sailors left pigs and sheep on islands to harvest years later when they came back. Could we too have been seated by E.T. to serve as an interstellar snack? Did opposable thumb and vocal cords give us a jump start on 98% DNA chimp kin? Religion is man-made, and Homo sapiens is Earth's only species that bought into it. Are Jewish, Christians, and Muslim religions any more credible than pagans? Desperate drawbacks like faith gene and all that wasted praying time, we taught, despite drawbacks, we topped the food chain. Were Big Bang and God invented to explain origin of universe? Did royalty accept infallible Pope and clergy confirm God's divine right of kings? Did omniscient, loving, merciful deity create universe where chaos reigns and genes are the luck of the draw? The most righteous could die in a volcanic eruption. Is choosing one religion over others a form of one-upmanship that the master race was guilty of? 
does it offer, does it differ from church state media monopoly that tells us only what they want us to know? Should we demand the same proof of superstition as signs today? What does clergy say? Religion started leper colonies, schools, and hospitals, but are priests and royalty parasitic and redundant in 21st century? Will we tithe till we die before we're free? Is the Antichrist Putin or Trump? Can we Google God and see? Is global warming an even greater threat to humanity? Did capitalist greed outperform socialism? Are Russia and China a blend of both? And is U.S. aim to diminish them for all the world to see? Should nations be submissive to UN like provinces are to federal government? If the world united like a bee colony, could UN cease all war and save our planet from asteroid calamity? Could this be the mark of civilization or will prolonged peace break U.S. war industry? Will G20 countries lower living standards to feed the world's needy? Will we share the wealth or are we too greedy? Is E.T. here to invite us to join Federation of Peaceful Planets? or to recruit the most practiced killers in a Milky Way galaxy. Thank you, Bob. We're finding those themes as each month goes by. <laughs> okay. All right, Bob. Okay, and uh, next up is uh, here in Shars as well. Stephen Novick is going to share some of his performance poetry, I'm guessing. Welcome, Stephen. Yeah. Me up there, Kyle. Ooh, 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 that sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> okay, oh, yeah, I, I shall have fun. First poem tonight is a classic of mine entitled The Midnight Rainbow. Come on, get out, leave your house tonight. Watch the Cosmic Ballroom's favorite dancer, the Midnight Rainbow, the Northern Lights. Now is it a wind whip ribbon or God's unsteady hand painting on our dark star-speck canvas? Is he drawing lines in the sand? Is this a display of natural neon or the breaking waves on the invisible shore which recede into the cosmos disappearing to come back? brighter than before. You can't bore me, Alice, with the aurora borealis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I picked that one. Where are you? <laughs> Always technical difficulties when you least expect them. <clears throat> Harbor Key visit highlight saw something magical, wondrous in its unnatural appearance, a bird in full span, seemingly stuck, suspended above the wharf, so in hard to know exactly what it felt, silly, stupid, angry, frustrated, exhilarated, giddy, Look, Ma, no flappies. <laughs> he hung there, a bird on no wires, until the wind said, enough of this illusion. <laughs> Thank you. And just for fun, here's one entitled Two in a Room. There's a girl you just met, and already you want to pet her. And there's the girl you met before, so which do you like better? Someone else will take you home, and that suits you to a letter. F for frustration. Grr. Look, there's the girl you met before, so which do you like better? Tonight, the girl you just met hugs you tight. You won't forget her. Take one more glance at the girl you met before, so which do you like better? Oh, the girl you just met, what would it take to net her? And there's the girl you met before, 
So which do you like better? Look at yourself, man. You're in a sweat and you're only getting wetter. Between the girl you've just met and the girl you've met before, which one do you like better? Both these girls make your heart race. You want so much to get together. A threesome in your dreams. <laughs> so which do you like better? Good night. Thank you, Steven. <laughs> Polish and fun as ever. Thank you, Stephen. Awesome. All right. And uh, second last reader here, Karen Poirier here in Char's Landing as well. Sharon's, uh, Karen's going to find her way up to the mic there, and Kyle's going to bring it down just an inch or two. There we go. Thanks. I lost my page. Yeah, those little pesky slips of paper, they can slide down on you. There you go. <laughs> there we go. Okay. okay. You got the spot. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to read another excerpt from my book, Across the Prairie Sky. <laughs> Yay. So, Mom, are you there? She heard a stirring, then saw her mom sitting on a chair beside William's bed. Her bent head was resting on the wall beside her, and her hands were protectively wrapped around the abundant bulge in her midsection. She was still wearing yesterday's dress, worn and wrinkled, partly unbuttoned, revealing glistening warm skin. Damp spots of sweat lay in patches on the bodice of her dress, and there was the unmistakable stale smell of vomit floating in William's room. Ellen realized that her mom hadn't gone to bed last night because she had been so busy looking after William. William was still sleeping, but he looked a little more peaceful to Ellen. Ellen, come here, she heard her mom whisper. Mom, what's wrong? Ellen looked fearfully at her mom's tired and sweaty face. I don't feel good, said mom. Listen to me, we need help. You need to get grandpa. Mom, are you sick too, said Ellen. I'm afraid so. Go and get Grandpa. Ellen, still in her nightgown and in bare feet, sprinted down the stairs to find her Grandpa in his room by the kitchen. She didn't have to wake him. Grandpa was already getting up from his bed. While sitting on the edge of his bed, he listened as Ellen told him about Mom and Daisy. His face dissolved into a sea of worried lines, and his shoulders stooped a little lower. Grandpa stood up with a snap of the elastic in his suspenders. He pulled them over his shoulders, his pants rising up and covering the long white underwear he was wearing. Okay, Ellen, I'm coming. Upstairs again, Ellen tried to make Daisy more comfortable. She picked up Molly and tucked her beside Daisy. Then she took off the quilt and straightened a sheet on top of her. Ellen's heart was racing. It was what she feared. Her family was all sick with influenza. Grandpa helped Mom into bed, and then with a deep sigh and a long look at Mom, he said to Ellen, We need help, Ellen. We need to send a telegram to your dad to come home. I don't know if the doctor is available, but we need his help too. Mom is really sick, isn't she, Grandpa? Yes, William, and Daisy too. They'll get better, won't they, Grandpa? We'll do our best. We can send a telegram from the store in Pratt, said Ellen. Yes, said Grandpa softly as he looked from one bedroom doorway to the other. I can do it, said Ellen. I'm not sick, and Nell can take me there. It's very cold, Ellen. Are you sure you can make the ride? I can do it, Grandpa. Nell and I, we can do it. Nell will take me. I'll be all right. Okay, Ellen, said Grandpa wearily. You'd better dress warm. I'll help you saddle Nell and get her ready. Quickly and mindlessly, Ellen got dressed, ran downstairs and grabbed a piece of bread from the kitchen shelf to eat on her way outdoors. She knew she had to hurry. There was no time to do the morning chores, but maybe Grandpa would look after the animals while she was gone. 
The crisp, cold, unforgiving air was a shock to her, biting the skin on her face. She pulled a scarf up around her mouth and her toque down, covering to the top of her eyes. The awakening morning was gray and ashen, but she was too intent on her journey to acknowledge it. She didn't pay attention to the crunching her boots made on the frosted snowy ground or to the tingling in her throat and the difficulty swallowing the bread she brought with her. Her head was bent and she didn't notice how stark the barn looked as she passed through it. Her only thought was to get to Pratt to send a telegram to her dad and to find Dr. Albertson. We need to hurry, Nell. You need to take me to Pratt. There's a girl, Nell. We'll make it. You'll see, said Ellen as she gave Nell a quick pat on her neck while offering her some oats in a small bucket, alternating with some water. Nell's chewing ceased momentarily, and she gave a snort as she looked at Ellen. The urgency of their mission was acknowledged and reflected in Nell's intelligent eyes. Grandpa finished putting the saddle on Nell and led her out of the barn. It's seven miles in bitter cold, girl. Make sure you ride careful, said Grandpa. I will, Grandpa. Don't worry. Nell will take me there and I'll get help. Ellen glanced backwards as she and Nell were riding away from the farm. Grandpa looked small and stooped, a sad shadow flickering on the misty snow as he raised his hand in a gesture of goodbye. Nell was urged on with a flick of the reins. It wasn't the carefree ride she was used to enjoying, and they had a long way to go in the cold gray cavern of worry that engulfed them. The pale gray outline of the general store and the train station took form on the distant prairie as Ellen rode towards it. It was bathed in the early morning feeling, a lonely feeling, just before the new day's warmth spread over the color-drained buildings and the monochromatic landscape. She was spent and hot, even in the bitter cold, and could only see through the pounding pain in her head as she was carried forward by Nell. Her body had drooped lower and lower on Nell, but she managed to hang on and keep talking to her. Keep going, girl. We need to get to the store. Nell, strong and steady, knew where she was going, and she courageously carried Ellen towards Pratt. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Just uh, struck me as you were reading that how, you know, what kids did in those days. <laughs> I mean, you know, today, you know, if they hook up the Chromecast, they're a hero. But I mean, you know, that, that's like, yeah, incredible. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. All right. I think we'll come to our last reader, which is me. I'm going to jump up and just share a couple of quick poems. Way up. There we go. Thank you, Kyle. All right. So I got a couple of um, poems to share. One kind of serious one we'll start with, and then we'll end with a light one. <clears throat> this one came um, the other day getting stuck on trying to get through the road past the fire at Angel Rock and uh, looking at this magnificent Douglas fir beside the road and the the trees behind it, because of the, the smoke in the air, that amber light, they were just gold, just golden in this, this big tree in front of it. And just the image was just so powerful, it just came out. So it's called Old Growth. If there had been no fire in the bluffs above Angel Rock, no stop and wait, single lane, alternating traffic. If there had been no Okanagan smoke to amber the morning sky, no gate to hold us back from angling off into an uncertain future. We would have sped past the calm silence of your furrowed trunk, weathered by seasons upon seasons of rain and sun, no appreciation for the sheer heft of that giant shaft. The saplings in the background tricked out in gold, no need to fumble out my phone to capture your image unblinking on the side of the blacktop. You, the one we drove past a thousand times, oblivious to how close it all is to going up in smoke. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> and then for something a little lighter to end on, 
Um, this kind of, you know, strikes me how today, you know, identities are, we're exposed to so much, our identities become this multifaceted thing from all over. And so I, I've picked a bit of a stereotype to, to poke some fun at in this, but um, I think we're, we're all in there somewhere. It's called Dashboard Buddha. I got this dashboard Buddha, got these Japa beads. If I ain't doing my mantra, I'm doing up some weed. I hang on Hornby Island because Denman's too square. I ain't attached to anything. Hey, don't touch my hair. I read the Celtic tarot. I use a pendulum. My spiritual name's Om Mani Padme Hum. I saw the Dalai Lama once. I sang Kirtan with Ram Das. I even channel Edgar Case if I get short on cash. I love to wear my birthday suit even when it's chilly, but never when the winter wind might shorten up my willy. I used to be a vegan, but now I'm eating raw, sucking up some wheat grass through a plastic straw. I'm a brother to the ocean, a sister to the trees, and half an ounce of vodka will bring me to my knees. I sleep inside a V-dub van, at least for all this summer, but if I go back to school, my daddy's buying me a Hummer. I don't support no sweatshops. My clothes are all handmade. And even this STD I got was given in fair trade. <laughs> you won't see me at Timmy Ho's or chilling down at Bucky's or hanging at the Arlington trying to get lucky. Because women seem to go for me like salmon for their roe. From cougars down to teeny bops, I'll be their gigolo. My mama hails from Washington. My papa's from LA. But I'm purebred Canadian because I was born here, eh? <laughs> I've even got a native name. They call me Little Brother from Cougars. Oh, no. And in my van's dream catcher, I hung a pigeon's feather. I've sweated in the sweat lodge. I beat an elk hide drum. I fast on every new moon and dance under the sun. Today, I'm Rastafarian speaking fluent Hindi. And underneath my dreadlocks, I wear a teeny bindi. On Sundays, I'm an Anglican. At Christmas, I'm a Jew. And if we hang out long enough... I'll turn sideways into you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, and so ends another version of Electric Mermaid live at Char's Landing. So glad to have everybody here tonight and uh, what a wealth of words we had and, and uh, such a variety. It never fails to astound me. You just never know what's going to come out on an Electric Mermaid night. So so be sure to put it on your calendar for next month. We'll be back here. Uh, it'll already be the end of September. Can you believe it? I feel like we just started summer. I don't know where it went. And and remind me of our feature, Carl, for next month. Say that aloud. Daniela Serenz. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it'll it'll be the last Wednesday of the month, 27th. There we go. And I know the month after that, uh, Bruce Hornage, some of you might know, uh, uh, who used to, who's read here a few times, he has finally got his book together called Loggerheads. And uh, that's going, that was in the last stages of editing last week. So I think uh, we're hoping to have him do his launch here uh, at the end of October. So that'll be good too. So big thank you to uh, to Char for hosting us tonight. For for running the Zoom and all that good stuff, and and so much better to have Kyle here doing the mic so she can relax and focus on one thing. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you. And thank you to Carl for moderating as always. <laughs> For those of you out there in Zoom land, thank you for tuning in. And if you haven't done your e-transfer to Shars Landing, uh, please do so. She can always use the cash. Yeah. Keep this place open. <laughs> thank you all for coming. And thank you for everybody and thank here you live at Shars Landing. And thank you especially to Rochelle Mecca for yes. her feature and for Leslie Omohundro for her spotlight as well. No. No, thank right. you, Leslie. And thank you, Derek. You're welcome. That's another one. It's a wrap. Keep writing. See you next month. <laughs> okay, bye everybody. Thank you. Bye, Kathy. bye Leslie. Bye.
Don't forget to send me an email. All right, well. <laughs> oh, <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Jennifer, out there in London. <laughs> right. Bye, Jennifer. I love you, Jennifer. I love to listen to your poems. Yeah, that's the chat. Thank you. Oh, wow. your wow. And wow. your stories were very poignant. Oh, yes. Each other oh, messages and messages to the group. my heart. <laughs> <laughs> night. Good night. Good night. And see, there's. Uh, All right, catch catch the blue moon. Oh yes, yeah, blue moon tonight. Blue moon. Big moon. Right. Right. I'm not gonna be here for the next one. <laughs> I'm gonna get Jennifer website. All right. Bye bye. Oh yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Good night. Good night, Leslie. She's gone. <laughs>